Few contemporary analysts have thought as deeply or as well about the problems of the modern world as William Pfaff, our guest today, and fewer still can boast of the kinds of credentials that he presents. In addition to being the author or co-author of six books published over three decades, Mr. Pfaff is currently a political commentator based in Paris for the International Herald Tribune, and his column is internationally syndicated by the Los Angeles Times. Before then, he spent two decades contributing political essays to the New Yorker magazine. And before then, he was an editor of Commonweal magazine, an executive of the parent organization of Radio Free Europe, and an early member of the policy research group, the Hudson Institute. At present, he is the 1995 Wayne Morris Chair of Law and Politics at the University of Oregon. He is also a director of the Council for Ethnic Accord, an attempt to mediate and mitigate ethnic tensions in the Balkans, Eastern Europe, and the republics of the former Soviet Union. As this last activity suggests, one of Mr. Pfaff's continuing interests has been the study of the positive and negative effects of nationalism. His most recent book, published in 1993, is entitled The Wrath of Nations, Civilization and the Furies of Nationalism. As Mr. Pfaff notes, nationalism has been the cause of much hateful violence in modern history and is so again today in the Balkans and the states of the former Soviet Union. The related phenomena of communal and racial violence afflict parts of Asia and Africa. However, Nationalism is also the force which confounded and broke the imperialism of Lenin's heirs and Nazism's domination of Europe in the 1940s. In other words, nationalism is a force with potential good, p tremendous potential for both good and evil. Mr. Pfaff has also observed that nationalism is not an ideology because it has no universality. And his, and his view of history is that some things get better and some get worse. Moral as well as institutional progress takes place, but also institutional and moral reg regression. Hence, the balance of good and evil in the world is today much what it was in Neolithic times. Mr. Pfaff will speak to us today about modern nationalism, including American nationalism, and its influence on international society especially since the collapse of communism in 1989. Please help me welcome William Pfaff to the City Club. Thank you very much for an extremely, extremely generous introduction, um, a generosity which I find um, universal in Oregon on this, my first visit. Um, <clears throat> 24 years ago, uh, next September, my wife and I, with our children, who were then seven and three, and uh, two dogs, a standard poodle and a mutt, sailed from New York on the Queen Elizabeth uh, for Cherbourg. Our intention was to spend a year or two in Paris. I was a member of an American research institute which had opened a branch in Paris. I intended to help put it on its feet and then to go home again. I'm still there. One thing led to another. I left the policy research group in 1978. Uh, the, Ameri the International Herald Tribune, uh, another American expatriate, but one that is now 108 years old, asked me to write a column for them. But I would be misleading you if I were to say that it was simply professional commitments that have kept me in Europe. Professionally, it has been important, uh, certainly, for anyone writing on international politics. Paris is a much better place to be than Washington or New York in that respect. Uh, in Washington or New York, one is inevitably a prisoner of the immense self-sufficiency and the self-preoccupation of the United States 
which um, as a continental power, rich in resources, uh, possessing a confidence in itself as representing human liberation, human rights, uh, a new order of mankind. Uh, as such, we have always found it difficult to see other countries, uh, not to see other countries as less enlightened, less advanced than we are, and therefore as not perhaps particularly interesting. But what do I see from Paris? For one thing, I see something that I think uh, important to say to an American audience, and particular to as important a West Coast audience as this one is. Um, this is a digression from my theme of nationalism, to which I'll come back shortly, but it is a point that I think is worth making. I see that it is Europe still where ideas technologies and political, political forces are generated that influence the world, as has been the case since at least the time of the Renaissance. I hold the currently uh, perhaps unfashionable view that Western civilization remains the most dynamic intellectual force in the world and the center of innovation and a source of progress. It still is the intellectual force against which all other societies are forced to react. The United States is part of that civilization. It remains culturally and essentially European society, despite current trends towards multiculturalism. I'm also convinced that Europe itself is and will remain for the foreseeable future the world's largest center of industrial power and wealth. Uh, this has not, of course, been the conventional wisdom in recent years. Even Europeans have been inclined to believe that their own societies, after the two great world wars, that their own societies were in some kind of comparative long-term decline. But I think that the present evidence is otherwise. In Asia, we see civilizations which have been abruptly awakened from a long sleep. We mostly believe that such nations as China, Indonesia, India, as well as Japan, are destined to play a great or even dominant role in the political and social affairs of the 21st century. And this indeed may prove to be true. However, that belief, I think, deserves a moment's critical examination. Japan, of course, is today the great Asian economic power. Yet its international political and strategic importance remains slight. That will change. When it changes, uh, this may not prove to have the happiest of consequences. For the present, however, it is Japan's e economy which makes Japan the only nation in Asia with genuine international power. Other countries in Asia are developing very rapidly economically, but they are not important on the scale in which the European countries remain important, even in the realm of industry and economy. And this is not generally understood, certainly in the United States. Last year at the time of the GATT negotiations, an American ambassador in Europe uh, complained to me about the difficulties European governments were making for the United States in trade negotiations. Uh, I should say that this ambassador was a political appointment, not a State Department professional. But the ambassador said, don't these little European countries understand that we don't really need them? If they make all this trouble for us, we'll just go off with Asia, and then they'll be sorry. I replied that it was the United States that was likely to be sorry if that happened. The 15 members of the European Union today make up the largest integrated economy on Earth. They are the most powerful trading power in the world today. My ambassador was one of many Americans who in recent years have become mesmerized by the growth of the Asian economies. But consider China. 
because there's so many people in China and the country is so big and it seems to be developing so rapidly, we're inclined automatically to think of it as a very powerful country and a huge economy, even though we understand that in per capita terms it remains a poor country. But a large population does not automatically mean power. A huge population can be a weakness. Uh, no one looks at India and equates population with power. Let me give you some simple economic comparisons. The Chinese nation had a gross domestic product in 1993 of slightly over $500 billion. That is slightly less than the gross domestic product of Spain. Spain's GDP was 582 billion. Now these are figures that are arrived at using the United Nations standardized system of national accounts. You can obtain a higher GDP figure for China using what the economists call purchasing power parities, which compares domestic buying power. But we must also ask if anybody knows what China's gross domestic product really is. It's a huge country with largely primitive transportation and communications, with a despotic government which encourages its functionaries to tell leaders what the leaders want to hear. And most of the country is cut off from foreign observation, uh, even remote to the central administrative authority, so that the picture we have of China is in fact an extrapolation from what we see happening in the coastal provinces where there's been great investment from uh, overseas Chinese, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, and the West. But in any case, uh, whatever the future does bring for China, its economy today is small on the world scale and backward by comparison with the economies of North America and Western Europe. And of course, it confronts a very grave challenge of political secession uh, when a moribund communist regime finally come to, comes to its, uh, its end. And, uh, and that may prove um, a very serious crisis. Uh, however, as things stand today, the Italian economy is twice as big as China's and of course is much more sophisticated and technologically advanced. Uh, the same point can be made about the other rapidly developing Asian economies. South Korea is a large economy by Asian standards, but it's smaller than the Netherlands economy. Singapore's GDP is some 51, 52 billion dollars. Portugal's is 85 billion. Indonesian GDP in 1993 was 138 billion dollars. Denmark's is 145 billion. And there are only a little more than five million Danes who generate that wealth and share it, whereas there are 200 million Indonesians. So let's not underestimate Europe. But economics is not the most important thing that's going to influence us and our children in the years to come. We have to take account of political and social forces. What counts is how governments of the world will interact with one another in the years to come. Uh, and what also counts profoundly are those deep political and social forces which drive peoples and governments. We do have a tendency to look at organizations and governments and what they say and pay attention to official declared policies and neglect society and national character and such forces as nationalism, uh, which is uh, intimately related uh, to the very source of human identity and society. And let me then uh, join my principal theme and say something about the origins of modern nations and modern nationalism. The origins of the modern nation lie in Western Europe, 
in the developing dynastic claims and dynastic frontiers of the feudal society left behind by the collapse of the Roman Empire. Uh, the wars, the marriages of feudal territorial lords are what shape the nations. All of this taking place within a, a universal European Christendom um, in which kings were held to possess their power as the agents of God's rule by divine right, and the Pope was the spiritual head of society, the Vicar of Christ. Um, and out of this then came the two original nation states, which were England uh, and France. France, which had invaded Norman France, which had invaded and conquered England, and then the Norman lords of England, who maintained that they still had their claim over the rule of France. And this was a matter that was then disputed by the 100 Years' War, um, ending with uh, the creation of a distinct English state and nation, which then turned away from European claims towards the sea, and strengthened the central authority of the French monarchy, uh, which, uh, whose, whose other frontiers remained uh, in flux. Later came the first non-city republic, the Netherlands, uh, and the other modern states, uh, or proto-modern states of Prussia, Sweden, Denmark, Poland. But there was a different phenomenon in the regions of Eastern Europe, where uh, the Habsburg Empire, which was the successor to the Holy Roman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, which was itself the successor of the great Arab empires of the 8th and 9th centuries, where they ruled over the whole East European region, uh, more or less successfully managing the many uh, subnational or linguistic or religious or historical uh, communities which existed uh, throughout the region. Uh, nationalism in the sense in which we understand it today uh, developed in Western Europe and Central Europe under French inspiration after the French Revolution uh, and with the ideas of the French Enlightenment and also in the German Romantic reaction against the universalism of uh, French claims at the time of the revolution. Um, modern nationalism was uh, heavily influenced by the Romanticism of the period, uh, which emphasized the values of specific place, of specific peoples, uh, specific histories against the conquest of French revolutionary armies and then of the Napoleonic armies uh, and the universal ideas which France at that time claimed to represent and indeed today continues to claim to represent. There is this profound resemblance to American society in that both of us see ourselves as the embodiment of mankind's most advanced uh, uh, stage in his struggle. The idea of the ethnic nation, a nation composed of a single people or race, uh, which has proved to be a terrible idea, uh, is a phenomenon of the 19th century. The British liberal historian Lord Acton wrote that resistance of people to the old dynastic regimes, the old monarchies of Europe, began in the defense of liberty and religion and nationality, uh, but the, the occupying powers, the rulers, were not attacked because they were foreigners, uh, which they frequently were. The, the Habsburg dynasty, the Bourbon dynasty was, were above nationality. And the, the, uh, uh, the, the realms uh, over which they ruled were made up of a great variety of, of national peoples. Uh, 
but this began in uh, a rebellion against uh, injustice, but then it slowly turned into the doctrine that a nation should not be governed by foreigners. Uh, race, so-called, in the 19th century use of that word, and nation now were thought to have to coincide. And it was, as Acton concluded, a retrograde step in history. Nonetheless, throughout the, 19, the later 19th century and into the 20th century, ethnic nationalism, this idea that every race deserves its own nation, uh, prevailed. It became the modern doctrine of universal national self-determination. Um, it was the great liberal cause of the later 19th and the early 20th centuries. Excuse me. The, element, the uh, settlements after the First World War, uh, reordering the, the collapse of, uh, or the remnants of the collapse of the Ottoman and Habsburg empires were based upon this idea that every people should have its own state, which excludes all other peoples. The idea of universal national self-determination was written into the United Nations Charter. But I say that it's a very bad idea. First of all, because it's nearly always impossible to achieve. The peoples involved are all but hopelessly intermingled. Their historical claims to nationhood, certainly those in Eastern Europe, usually involve a certain amount, if not a considerable amount, of invention and myth-making. Um, ethnically pure nations can usually be had only by massive population transfers or expulsions, such as actually occurred uh, before, during, and after the Second World War, uh, an earlier manifest manifestation of the ethnic cleansing we've seen more recently in the Balkans. What ordinarily is the case is that a newly established nation is dominated by the majority race with all of the other inhabitants implicitly, if not explicitly, identified as inferior beings uh, and as potential, if not actual, subversives, as agents of the rival nation in which their own nationality is majority and where it no doubt oppresses still others. Nonetheless, this idea of universal national self-determination uh, prevailed in uh, American and indeed French thinking. Those were the two principal influences on the treaty settlements in 1920-21. And it largely prevails even today in considerations of how to solve the problems of Eastern and Balkan Europe and the ex-Soviet Union. The Vance Owen and Stoltenberg Owen and contacts group plans to settle the war in the former Yugoslavia have all amounted to a reductio ad absurdum of this idea, with localities and even villages being split up on maps according to allegedly ethnic criteria. Now, if it were possible successfully to settle the problems of these regions formerly dominated by Soviet Union, uh, through the application of this principle of universal national self-determination, no one could reasonably object. Uh, there's nothing surprising that a group of people who do feel themselves to be a distinct people, a distinct nation, uh, want to live with themselves alone, as the Irish nationalists put it uh, in 1913. The difficulty is that they do this at the expense of others. Others who have to be expelled from the national territory, or if not expelled, held in a position of inferiority or oppression. And this, alas, is usually the case. Uh, thus, it is a principle which either institutionalizes or uh, creates injustice. Now, to say that this is so uh, obviously changes nothing. 
But it seems to me important that people do grasp the fact that this idea of universal national self-determination uh, is a dangerous one, if not a pernicious one. And that the liberal principle of secular citizenship and non-ethnic democratic government deserves systematic defense. An individual's sense of nationality is primordial to his or her conviction of private identity. It's a fundamental element in political as well as private society. But it's essential that nationality be understood as cultural and historical, and citizenship as secular and non-discriminatory. The moment a state is defined as the nation of the Hungarians, or of the Slovaks, or of the Romanians, or of the Irish, or of the Protestant Irish, or of the Quebecers, or of the non-Quebecers, or America, love it or leave it, um, everyone else is relegated to an invidious and uh, theoretically, if not potentially, subversive role. They are identified as obstacles to the nation's fulfillment. They, have, they eventually have to be disposed of some way or another. Now let me turn back to the situation of the non-ethnic Western nation uh, and to the question of ethnicity. A distinction has to be drawn between immigrant and non-immigrant nations. Canada, the United States, Australia, and France are the principal immigrant nations. The former, we, the Canadians, the Australians, New Zealanders, were created as immigrant nations. Uh, <coughs> France is one by virtue of its political ideology uh, that um, uh, because of the Enlightenment and the Revolution, it uh, stands for a more advanced kind of society and has a duty to welcome those who want to convert to its values, just like the United States. We're both ideological nations in this respect. And of course, this ideological commitment conveys its own form of nationalism, embodied in the idea that we are the moral superiors of the world. Uh, and out of that assumption, much evil has come. Now, if you are going to convert people to your values, uh, this means you're going to assimilate immigrants. And all of the immigrant nations have taken for granted until now that those who came to their country should and should indeed want to adopt the norms and the values of their new society. And so school systems indoctrinated the new citizens not only in language but in history and heritage so that the child of Slavic peasants or East European Jewish immigrants to the United States was instructed about his Puritan and pioneer forebears. And uh, their equivalent in France were told about their ancestors, the Gauls. Uh, and it worked. Assimilation works. Hence, uh, and this is a parenthetical remark on a, uh, a side issue, but one of, of consequence in the US, uh, hence, ex the experiment with a multi multinationalism or a multiculturalism in a society and in its schools strikes me as a, um, a casual and extremely unconsidered experiment, uh, which goes against the proven uh, validity in an immigrant society of uh, a deliberate policy of cultural uh, integration and assimilation. The non-immigrant Western state, of which Britain, for example, uh, ordinarily uh, has a diverse uh, origins and a combination of original or early populations, in the British case, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Celts, uh, mm -hmm. modified by subsequent migrations or conquests, in the British case by the Romans and by the, uh, the Normans, who in fact were Norsemen. Uh, historically, it has found its identity in its cultural, religious, dynastic, constitutional uh, development. 
uh, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, the Netherlands are other examples. Scandinavia is an exception because it is ethnically largely uh, homogeneous, and yet in that case there's not, th well, not one nation but three who spent most of their history fighting one another. Um, in the present day, with the movement of populations we've seen, particularly since the Second World War, immigration to these uh, 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 historically non-immigrant societies uh, has been acceptable up to a point, although it has proven to make difficulties um, uh, when it passes a certain threshold of, of numbers. Uh, people, though, generally are willing because of the, the fact that it is already a diverse society and that citizenship is secular and constitutional, uh, and even because there's been an imperial past which has habituated people to think in terms of a variety of peoples, uh, the levels of immigration, which are in fact quite small, that exist in Britain and the other North European countries have been tolerated, have been acceptable. Germany presents a specific European problem because while its origins are similar to the other West European states, since the mid-19th century, it has conceived of itself, uh, conceived of its identity in racial terms, largely as a result of a deliberate propaganda campaign by Bismarck at the time of German unification. He said there is a German race and all the members of this race must be gathered within Germany. Uh, and of course, at the beginning of the 19th century, there were something more than a thousand individual sovereign states and cities and duchies, uh, all German speaking, but all part of the old Holy Roman, Roman Empire, but with autonomy within this system. And it was Bismarck's um, self conceived mission to bring all of these into a unified state dominated by Prussia. In any case, the idea that Germany, the Germans are a race. Uh, has made a, uh, not only a great deal of mischief and unhappiness, uh, including for the Germans themselves, um, but is the reason for a certain national confusion in Germany uh, today when it's presented with a large Turkish worker population, uh, which is not German in blood, and which uh, until now has had been presented with the greatest of difficulties in obtaining German citizenship, despite, uh, in many cases, the younger generation being entirely German in culture. However, this is a problem the Germans are attempting with considerable forbearance and generosity to deal with at the present time. Um, let me conclude, however, on a somewhat more positive note than my previous remarks perhaps implied. What symbolizes the most remarkable change that has taken place in the last 50 years? I would say it is that this audience should include people originally from many different countries, and that it should be a perfectly banal affair that I should have flown back to the United States to spend two weeks as a guest of the University of Oregon, that many of the faculty and the students of that university think nothing of scattering to the corners of the earth this spring in their, on their holidays or their research undertakings. This would not have been the case a half century ago. Uh, even if there had been no war, uh, we probably would have been much more likely to have remained where we were born. Only a few, 50 years ago, had traveled very much. I'm not that old, but I remember that when I first went across the Atlantic in 1950 on a student trip, it was with the idea in my head that this might be my only chance in life to see Europe. Many of the young people in my group thought that. Certainly few of our, pen a few of our parents would have been outside the United States, um, and most of them that had been abroad had been dragged there by the World War. Today, the change is revolutionary. The advanced industrial countries in particular are so interlinked and interdependent, so intimately involved with one another, that a kind of international citizenship, a liberal citizenship, has emerged. We're in constant uh, and cooperative communication with one another. 
through our governments, through a multitude of international organizations. Our economies are connected through international financial and trading communities, the multinational corporation, ourselves through our professional associations. We're associated by popular communications. We're associated uh, by everything uh, that goes from satellite television on the one hand to the academic seminar on the other. And this has truly transformed the world. We talk about European Union, but in a real sense, there's come to be a democracies union, or the union of the industrial world, the trading world's union. It's an unprecedented situation, and this is very important and very valuable. And it is a reason for hope and for some confidence. But this confidence, I think, must also be qualified uh, because dangers exist as well. Within this newly united world, there are also disruptive and degenerative economic and social forces that if we let them could make all of us worse off rather than better. The speed of communication supports bad ideas as well as good ones. The manipulation of modern communications was a source of the furious destructiveness of the Yugoslav War. Uh, the emphasis placed on sheer economic return in the international economy um, and of the notion that labor is merely another commodity uh, is, uh, 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 is something which is capable of producing um, uh, extremely destructive social and dangerous political repercussions. So this conclusion of mine, um, which expresses, I assure you, an uncharacteristic optimism, uh, in which I suggest that our liberal commonwealth of the democracies might, if it is fortunate, in the years to come, expand its influence outward, radiate its values to a larger world still caught up in oppression and violence, uh, but, of course, the opposite could be the reverse. And even the democracies, as we know from 1914 uh, and 1940, uh, know the power uh, of and social and political progress. There's also retrogression. Uh, and man in his moral being, his moral capacity, does not, I think, progress. Uh, his constant struggle is with himself. Thank you. Vivian Solomon, member of the Board of Governors. In light of terrorist actions in the recent past, could you please comment on the connection between the rise in nationalism and terrorism? The rise of nationalism um, presents a series of values, as I've said, which would seem to justify extreme action. It closes people in upon themselves. If you see the world in terms of um, validation of your own nation's existence or the realization of your own nation's uh, political uh, uh, existence, then it's very, easily to, very easy to feel that you are licensed to, to do whatever is necessary. It's very dangerous in politics when people conduct themselves, uh, let's say, on the order of virtue uh, of metaphysics rather than that of practicality. The virtue of democracy has always been that uh, one makes practical arrangements and practical judgments and compromises. We understand that that's of the essence of democratic politics. Nationalist politics uh, is uncompromising of its nature. Uh, hence, to blow up the federal building in, in Oklahoma City, assuming as we, I mean, we have no reason at this point uh, uh, to conclude that this is so. But if this were an act 
of uh, outraged nationalism, uh, it, would, uh, as, uh, it would be uh, not in the least uncharacteristic of what we have seen in um, the struggles of the years since the Second World War and uh, between the Second World Wars. Uh, yes, Lawrence Cotton from the Arts and Culture Committee. I'd like to draw on uh, some points raised uh, in your book, The Wrath of Nations, and again at the end of today's talk. Given the reemergence of nationalism and nationalist tendencies, and your uh, sober instruction to us that we must uh, differentiate between the progress of civilization and the more wayward progress of man, to paraphrase from you, reporting it differently are, are uh, perhaps inadequate and variable moral development. Is it possible for modern late 20th century Western liberal democracy to better account for our internal and external contradictions, uh, to better account for the two sides of our nature? And if so, how? <laughs> well, you've asked an unanswerable question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is the constant uh, struggle. How do we improve our democracy? How do we make it work better? How do we uh, uh, increase the, the levels of tolerance, the, the willingness to accommodate other interests. Um, I would say, you say what to do. One thing I think is very important and in which we've been failing in this country is simple education. Uh, the, our educational system, the, uh, and I'm thinking particularly of primary and elementary education, as we all know, is, is um, is in, uh, in many places in serious uh, difficulties. It's not uh, what, it, what it once was for a number of, of social uh, as well as political reasons. But uh, it's vital to have an educated uh, populace. The degree of misinformation that um, exists in American political discussion is, is quite uh, distressing. I mean, it's not a question of being of different opinions. It's uh, which is part of democracy. You know, you all of the great issues of controversy. Well, fine, you, you're on one side or on the other side. But when you function in a in a haze of ignorance or of misinformation about the forces that uh, that are the occult forces that are really manipulating what goes on in the world then I think a democracy is in, is in serious trouble. And this is something in which the comparison with Europe uh, does us shame, because the levels of, of disciplined education, of serious knowledge, capacity to read and write and reason, uh, to read critically, is much, much higher in the West European countries uh, than it is here. And I think that uh, uh, while well, people perhaps in this audience are aware of our difficulties in this matter. I think there's a larger, you know, a complacency of people say, oh, well, we're, we're the best and um, uh, everybody else envies us. And no, we, we, uh, we are in serious danger in this respect of having a politics that is being driven by, uh, by non-realities. open up the floor to questions. George Boudreau, City Club member. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could comment on the assimilation of, of East Germans into West Germany since the unification of Germany. And if this, and when it is successful, will this not create a political problem in Europe itself? In Germany itself? In, in, in Europe as a whole. Oh, in Europe as a whole. It, as coming back to the U.S. Uh, well, there's been a problem of, uh, certainly, uh, a cultural problem between East Germany and West Germany uh, of assumptions. It's, it's a product of education, of the political assumptions, of the political uh, norms of the two societies over the post-war generations, as well as of uh, unrealistic expectations aroused uh, in the months that led up to the fall of the German Wall. But I think that this is a problem <clears throat> which, uh, if it is never solved for the, the 
presently, uh, the present generation, if the people who were adults when this uh, uh, change took place are never entirely reconciled or never uh, en entirely get over this legacy, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that the, the generation which follows will be uh, one which is as, as unified as, uh, as the Federal Republic of Germany has been. One should, of course, remember that uh, Germany, in any case, uh, is a country with very strong regional um, characteristics. Uh, it's not a country with a strong central government. It's a country in which not only politics, but uh, cultural initiatives and so forth are, are regional. The cultural subsidies, the broadcasting are all under the control of regional authorities and not uh, the central authority. Now, whether this, uh, uh, say, fully united Germany, uh, culturally reunited Germany becomes a problem for Europe as a whole, uh, Germany may become a problem for, Ger for Europe as a whole simply because Germany is a little too large. Uh, it's disproportionately larger than, its, than the other major West European countries. It's about now, since it's unified, it's about a third larger than France, which is the second largest of the, of the um, or second most populous of the West European countries. Uh, and yes, this presents a problem. Uh, it's always been a problem in Europe. And that's one of the reasons, it was one of the reasons why the European Union was created, and that's one of the reasons that it's going to, to, to go forward. It may not go forward in the way it's discussed at the present time, but it's going to go forward because the French understand that they have to have European Union, not only the French, the French, the Dutch, the Italians, the, uh, the Belgians, uh, even the British, understand that they need the European Union to incorporate Germany in a larger effort. And the Germans understand that uh, their history as, a, as an independent actor on the European scene since unification in uh, 1870 uh, has been a disaster for them. And uh, so while the Germans are, are, are once again debating their future and nationalist issues uh, are a theme even in the intellectual debate, um, uh, I think that, um, that everyone is aware of the potentialities in this situation and uh, that there is large agreement throughout Europe that the, you know, the solution not only should be but will be found in the institutions of European uh, cooperation, federation, whatever. Yes? Uh, Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. Uh, Professor Pfaff, uh, do you believe that uh, the European community will progress towards greater integrated unity, uh, meaning probably political unity, uh, in addition to economic unity and so on and so forth. What is your uh, assessment of the situation? Do you think that they will be able to uh, become more united uh, as, a, as a multi-nation, I guess? Or? I think that there will never be a United States of Europe that is isn't uh, truly comparable to the United States of America. Uh, if only because, I, I mean, we had enough trouble putting together uh, a union of states which were all, uh, virtually all, of identical cultural origin, speaking the same language, having the same political and legal institutions, having the same outlook on, uh, upon the world. Um, uh, this was a, a struggle uh, right up to the time of the Civil War, and then we fought a civil war about it. And it was only after that that the issue was settled, or at least it wasn't until recently. I understand that you people are planning another secession. Um, but um, uh, th there, there's no real analogy with countries with the, the differences, historical differences, the differences in assumption, the differences in culture uh, of well, say from Britain or Ireland at the one end to Romania and um, Bulgaria at the other, who are countries that at least are spoken of as potentially members of the European Union, but even of the present members. You've got Sweden, which is 
found its security in, uh, in, in uh, neutrality, neutralism, over the last 300 years. And you've got Germany, which has uh, been a, a warlike power. You've got France and Britain, which were both imperial powers. Uh, the Netherlands, which was an imperial power, which fought a colonial war, excuse me, for several years after the Second World War to keep Indonesia. And on the other hand, you have countries uh, who have, uh, such as uh, uh, Belgium, Denmark, who have uh, been the victims and who have attempted to, to seek their security and staying out of the way of the great powers. It's very difficult to put them together and say you're going to have a foreign policy, you're going to have a security policy, you're going to act in the world in the way that the United States acts. It's just not in the cards that that will happen, in my opinion. On the other hand, you already have an effective economic union. You have a huge single market. You have a rapidly continuing and increasing economic integration, corporate integration. It's, it's not just that the, the governments are acting. It's that every corporation in Europe has, has got his transnational partners and his transnational suppliers. Um, the whole thing is functioning more and more as a, as a single economy. It would be virtually impossible to take it apart. Um, so that economically, the union exists. Um, culturally, it exists not in the sense that everybody is culturally this you know, integrated, uh, but it is that there is a basic assumption of life in Europe now that, yes, one is Dutch or, or Italian, but one is a European as well. Now, the, it's conceivable that this will prove a fragile accomplishment, but I think not. I think the younger generations uh, in particular, they take it for granted. They're zooming back and forth across Europe, their friends everywhere uh, in Europe, their holidays and all of that. So that I think that the, uh, to, to come to an end, the, um, the future for Europe continues to be very complex. Uh, integration is a reality, uh, a continuing integration and unification is a reality, but on the other hand, uh, it uh, will be by no such simple model as uh, exists in the United States. How soon a, a common currency, for instance, which has been mm. in, in the process, I understand, the ECU, I guess, or whatever they call it. The AQ. Um, they're talking about it, I mean, they're supposed to have it, I think, within, I think there's a formal goal of two years. Yeah, you know, in two years, they are supposed to have it. Uh, there's some talk now of having it within one year. But um, you certainly are not going to have it with a central bank and displacing the other currencies. You could conceivably have it among the core countries. You could have a... Franco-German Benelux common currency. But even then, I doubt it, because the Germans don't want to give up the mark and, um, and the others have their anxieties. But that you can have uh, you know, a 16th currency for the 15 members of the Union, that, I think, is um, uh, you could have even within a, uh, within a year. That is to say, you'd have the AQ circulating um, in addition to the national currencies, which is to say, you have uh, an association of currencies with you know, the possibility of fluctuation in exchange rates, but that you're writing your contracts, you're doing your national budgets, you're doing your international exchange, all in terms of the AQ, not of the national currencies. And with that, a lot of the, uh, of the, of the problems of uh, currency relationships and the headaches that it produces, of the changing currency relationships, the headaches it produces, uh, for companies and for individuals in Europe, you could uh, you can get around that. So I think that's a, that's a, a really a possibility in a fairly short um, fairly short time scale. We have time for one short question. Okay, <clears throat> it's short. Uh, my name is Tom Dunn. I'm a new uh, City Club member, and I just wonder uh, what you see as the most significant role for the United Nations to play for a better world, better world order. Well, the United Nations is the, the instrument of its members. It'll play the role that its, uh, that its members assign to it. 
Um, I mean, it's not going to take the place of nations. It's not going to become a world government. On the other hand, it has been an immensely useful and indispensable agency for uh, not only all kinds of matters of practical international cooperation, but also for collective action in such affairs as, as Yugoslavia or other uh, troubled spots in the world, which are uh, frequently not that successful. But uh, consider the alternative. Thank you, Mr. Pfaff, for your thoughtful remarks. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.